I was just wondering if you could maybe elaborate a little bit or maybe describe the different types of pain that you've experienced from uh, being envenomated. Sure. Well, I mean, <laughs> that could be a really long-winded answer. Um, I'll try to keep it as generalized as possible. <laughs> Yeah, it was something I was uh, discussing uh, last night. He, my, my son was asking uh, why you had never been bit by a tarantula. And I was like, he, he would probably have to go far out of his way to get a tarantula to bite him. They're, they're, they're more prone to run and hide. You really got to upset one to get him to strike. Yeah, it's kind of like for, at least in my experiences, and again, this is just basically with the tarantulas in the Southwest and a couple of species in Central America. In most instances, you're right. They're more apt to moving away from you, maybe flicking off some urticating hairs, or at the very least, they're really just going to kind of sit there and crawl on you. And to really ever kind of push that animal to the point where it feels it needs to bite, we've never been comfortable being like, okay, cool, we're going to just keep pushing on you until you bite somebody. It's it's not going to happen. Right. Yeah. Now, have, yeah, we, have you ever been haired by a tarantula? Uh, I have, um, actually, before. Not really bad. Like, nothing's ever gotten into my eyes, but I have gotten, like, a couple of flecks of something into my nose before. And that's just, you know how easily those hairs can flick off. So right. it's all about any time I interact with them, being as calm as possible and really letting that spider acclimate to you and let it walk up onto your hand versus, like, you know, you don't just come in and pick it up and place it there. You got to gently coax it so that it doesn't feel threatened. Correct. Yeah, and actually medically, I'd be more concerned about the hairs. I mean, if those hairs get in your eyes, they, they can barb in there, they get in your cornea. You mm -hmm. gotta you sometimes need surgery. Sometimes the eye surgeons will go in there and actually pick them out, and then you need months long of antibiotics and steroids, and it's a disaster. I'd be much more afraid of the hairs getting in my eyes than, and a bite. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. We, you know, we always tell people in any episodes that we interact with tarantulas to, you know, it's not something you need to be afraid of. Don't try to pick it up and handle it. Admire it from a safe distance. And really we tell people to not interact with them, not because we're worried about somebody being bitten and envenomated, but more so because of those urticating hairs. So mm. that's a really good point. Yeah, I, uh, right. I, I've been doing, I've been keeping tarantulas and scorpions and stuff for uh, over 20 years at this point and have never been bitten or stung. And, you know, I, I found a little, uh, <laughs> I was, you know, I think it was the episode where you went to the, uh, reptile uh, sanctuary in Sydney, Australia, and there was a, a gentleman there milking the Sydney funnel web spiders, and had said he had never been bitten. And I was like, "Yes, finally!" There, you know, you, you can interact with with snakes and scorpions, and maybe not so much snakes, but tarantulas and scorpions, and and avoid getting bitten, especially if you know if you're uh, taking the correct steps and, and you're being safe. Um, I did have a question for you though. Uh, I, I get asked this a lot. There's some species of tarantulas like uh, Postlotharia metallica um you know a lot of like the the asian arboreal tarantulas that have very potent venom and you know there's, there hasn't been a whole lot of scientific study on the effects on the body uh, but you do have a lot of people uh you know when they're reporting the effects of the bite they say that they're dealing with um kind of like the side effects of the venom weeks or months down the road you know like they're dealing with like muscle spasms and stiff joints and and issues like that. And I was I was just wondering, Coyote, uh, with all the uh, venom injections that you've had from different species, have you ever had, have you been dealing with any kind of health issues further on down the road? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I get that asked me quite often. And, you know, the one thing I always say to people is there's a big difference between a bite and a sting when it comes to the, the venom, the uh, the, the uh, compounds of the venom and of course the venom yield because venom yield is a, a big aspect to play with things and as you guys know for anybody that's watching when an insect stings you that's a defense maneuver for the most part right not necessarily uh, a, the amount of venom where something's trying to kill and eat something else so I'm getting stung by something like an execution wasp or a bullet ant you know that's not the amount of venom that an animal will be looking to kill its potential prey item versus something like the bite of a rattlesnake. Now, I've never been bitten by a rattlesnake intentionally or accidentally, thankfully. Um, the most potent intentional bite that I've taken for, with venom would be the giant desert centipede. Now, that one was extremely painful and I had some pretty severe after effects in the days after the fact, but nothing long term. Um, same goes for the Gila monster. I was accidentally bitten by a Gila monster which is without question the worst pain I've ever experienced. But again, the after effects were nothing beyond a 36 hour level of discomfort. Um, there were no lasting effects from 
that envenomation. But it's also fair to say that there was a very minimal amount of envenomation. My thumb was in the mouth of that Gila monster for less than a second before I ripped it out. So it's not like it got a hold of me and chewed in a large venom yield. So I think there's probably something that has to do with the amount of venom that somebody takes as to whether or not it's going to have a long-term effect. Now, yeah. Coyote, as someone that's uh, been bit and stung by, you know, a various amount of, of insects, and, you know, like spiders and scorpions, uh, could you, I, I know that different types of scorpions and, and spiders have different types of uh, venom, like the chemical makeup of it is uh, drastically different. So it would have different effects on the human body. And uh, I was just wondering if you could maybe elaborate a little bit or maybe describe the different types of pain that you've experienced from uh, being envenomated. Sure. Well, I mean, <laughs> that's going to be a really long-winded answer. Um, I'll try to keep it as generalized as possible. Um, again, it goes, there's a big difference between bites and stings when it comes to venom yield. So venom yield is first and foremost, uh, the most important factor when it comes to likely the amount of pain that you're going to experience. So I think everybody's pretty familiar with the fact that I've been stung by a bullet ant. Now, I was stung by a single bullet ant versus ever wearing the bullet ant gloves or, you know, shoving my hand into a nest of bullet ants. There's a rhyme and reason as to why we produced that episode the way that we did. Um, and the bullet ant specifically is armed with a Panera toxin that specifically has almost a time release pain agent to it. Uh, and the purpose of that is more for the protection of an ant's nest. Now, the makeup of an ant society is structured in a variety of ways and the ants that guard the front of the entrance to their den, right? And most of the times uh, they build a nest that is compartmentalized into a very large tree. So you might only find a little tiny hole in the ground. Those ants, those soldiers that are guarding the front of the nest are usually more aggressive and usually have a more potent venom. Now, I don't know what the reason is for the potency of that venom, if it's, it's what it is that they're eating, um, if they've been designed a specific way to combine what they're eating together with their venom and their aggression level to be more painful. I just know that we were instructed in the research that we did ahead of time, if you want the truly painful sting from a bullet ant, you gotta catch a soldier. The random ones that are foraging around out in the rainforest, don't necessarily have as potent of a sting. Now the Panera toxin that comes from the bullet ant, like I said, almost has like a time release agent to its pain. And it's extreme right from the get go, but it lasts and lasts and lasts. And my experience lasted close to 36 hours, but some of the you know in indigenous tribes in Central and South America that will wear the bullet ant gloves that are taking you know dozens of stings at a time, they can spend days going through an incredible amount of pain and ultimately end up going into a state of hallucination, which is part of that uh, spiritual ritual that they go through that transitions them into essentially qualifying as a hunter for the tribe. Now, if you look at something like a tarantula hawk, very large wasp, it's gonna have a, a larger venom yield, but it's a very fast acting venom because as you guys, of course, know the tarantula hawk uses its sting to paralyze a tarantula so that it can then drag it down into a burrow and, and essentially start the life cycle again by, by implanting an egg or, or several eggs. I, I'm not sure which it is. Um, but that sting is so incredibly hitting from the get-go because that tarantula hawk needs to immediately paralyze that tarantula. So there's going to be a big difference between the potency of a tarantula hawk sting versus something like a honeybee. But then, then again, if you look at honeybees or you look at basic you know, hornets or paper wasps, you disturb a nest of something like that where you're taking multiple stings all at the same time, that compounded effect can sometimes be worse than maybe the single sting of a tarantula hawk. So I'll kind of pause it there and see where you want me to go. But there is quite a bit of a difference based on the species of insect that is delivering the sting the venom yield, and of course, what that venom is used for specifically. Have you had any close calls where you needed hospitalization or, or at least your crew was considering taking you to the hospital? Uh, not throughout the making of the television show. And again, you know, good production always puts you in the safest scenarios possible. The amount of research that you do, taking your time, trying to be as careful as possible whenever interacting with any animal species. And again, we're constantly working with experts in the field, whether you see them on camera or not, we take every protocol that we possibly can to ensure the safety of myself, the animals, and of course, the crew. The only time that I've ever had to seek medical attention was actually after the giant desert centipede bite. And that was on my own accord after nine hours of excruciating pain to the point, when we say excruciating, it's like 
you think that it might be better to cut off your arm because it might be less painful to be missing an appendage than it is to continue dealing with the pain of the venom. Uh, and I essentially went to an emergency center, sort of made up a clever story for what happened to me. So it didn't seem like I intentionally got myself bitten by a centipede. Um, and, you know, they basically prescribed me like a super strength uh, Advil, so to speak, just basic painkillers to say, look, this is going to take the edge off. The swelling will probably go down within, you know, the next 24 to 48 hours and you'll be fine. And, you know, people don't know a whole lot about centipede bites because there aren't that many people getting bitten by giant desert centipedes. So my education in the subject matter ultimately ended up being a pretty cool, like long term test that I could probably write down or share with somebody that wanted to do a journal entry someday. Um, but the biggest discomfort actually came in the following two weeks with the amount of itching that came from the bite. Um, I ended up having this almost like a, a couple of BB sized lumps in my arm, uh, kind of where the uh, fangs or the, the pinchers went into my arm. And I don't know if that was like the destruction of cells underneath the skin, but I would have several times throughout the day where my arm would just like flare up with this uncontrollable itch and it would swell back up. And then after I stopped messing with it, you know, and about 45 minutes later, it would swell back down. And this happened consistently day on and day off for about two weeks after the centipede bite. So, um, you know, I don't know what exactly caused that from a medical stance, but it certainly was uh, a discomfort to deal with, but I'd rather be itching than be hurting.